All right, so before I really get started, I just want to say I have a cold. This is not my normal voice. I have a nice voice normally. Um, so if I have to stop to breathe, that is why. I don't have COVID. You can come hang out after, I promise. I don't have COVID. Just have a cold. So uh, who here is making implant bars? A couple people? A couple people? Uh, who's doing um, like acrylic implant cases? Awesome, awesome. And who wants to do more acrylic implant cases? Everybody, awesome. So what we're going to go over today is um, we're primarily focusing on acrylic. This is not a zirconia course. If that's what you're looking for, my apologies. So we're going to be focusing on titanium bars uh, and some acrylic overdentures and acrylic fixed dentures and kind of how we can get there, some tips and tricks on um, working on these workflows. So uh, it's not super in depth, but we're going to give you guys some of the basics, some tips to get your implant cases moving. My name is Pam. <laughs> I am a RDT in Canada. I have been a dental technician for about 10 years, like Richard said, um, and I have been a removables the entire time. So I ran a removables department in a full service lab for several years. I kind of worked my way up to the manager position and was running that for a while. It's very difficult working with lots of dentists. I know some of you here in the lab space understand the challenges. I started um, doing some courses for denturists just locally uh, for implant cases. And you know what, denturists are really cool, especially in Canada. And I fell in love with the community. They were so welcoming, they were so warm. So I left the lab and I went to go work directly for a denturist. So I was an in-house lab technician for a denturist. There was two denturists in our clinic. And in 2019, we went fully digital. So we got a mill, a scanner, a printer uh, in one weekend. And we got <laughs> no training, but we went from absolute uh, analog to absolute digital in one weekend. We never set another case in wax ever again. Um, so it was a little bit of a hectic transition. And then a couple months after that, once we figured out, got our feet down on regular dentures, which I will talk about more tomorrow, we started uh, transitioning our implant cases because really we could see the value there. Implant cases take a long time. And typically when you're doing your implant cases, you are destroying your models after. You're, you're getting rid of data, and that data is so important. And so if we could keep that data forever for our patients, this is a huge improvement. So aside from my dental hobbying, I am a Canadian. I do like to do Canadian things. I, I like to quilt. It's very cold in Canada. I make quilts for all my dental friends. I like to go fishing when it's warm. I have a little chihuahua, that's my husband. I am a human outside of dental sometimes, so, you know, come chat, come say hi after. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about patient selection and case planning. We're not gonna go too much into that, but I personally think that is an extremely important part of doing your implant cases. Uh, we're gonna kinda go through what types of bar restorations we can be looking at here. Some componentry, bar design. Um, <clears throat> I use three shapes, so this is gonna be three shape shape based. Uh, we're going to talk about some acrylic finishing, some manufacturing, uh, and that's it. <laughs> so let's talk about patient selection and planning. I know coming from the lab side, sometimes you don't feel like you have the control of this. Coming from the clinical side, you do have that control. From the lab side, you really, really need to make those connections with your surgeons. You need to make those connections with the people placing your implants. And you need to plan these cases before you place the implants. These cases should be prosthetically driven. Um, and understanding what you need to make a, a nice prosthetic is going to help you working with your surgeons a little bit better. So some of the things that you need to be aware of, and we'll, we'll dive into this a little bit more, <coughs> sorry, is um, restorative space, smile lines, lip support, bone quality, and patient hygiene and compliance. And sometimes you might want to consider the patient itself, age, weight, size, strength, that kind of thing. So let's break that down a little bit more. <clears throat> Restorative space. This is probably the absolute number one thing that needs to be planned for. If you look at nothing else, you need to be looking at restorative space. So this is how we used to measure it in the analog world. Uh, we would literally mount our cases, take a little ruler, and try to find the tightest spaces. We're, we're measuring in multiple places, not just one. And <coughs> the space that we need, if you can imagine 
a restoration, okay? So this would be a hybrid. So the bar with the acrylic and the tooth, you need to accommodate for all of those pieces. Um, and you don't want to be limiting the space on that because what's going to happen is you're going to break your restoration. So really, for a case like that, 10 millimeters of space is your absolute limit. When I'm working with surgeons, I say I need 12. If I ask for 12, hopefully I get 10. So what they can do is um, an alveo, like a bone reduction, or you can open the bite. These are all things to look at before you place the implants. So if it's a case uh, with a metal bar with attachments, you need even more space. So the bar itself, minimum, minimum, three millimeters. Typically, you're looking at four. The attachments take up a lot of space on a bar like this. So you're looking at three millimeters just for the attachments. And then you really want, like I put acrylic one millimeter, that's pretty thin. You do want a nice hearty amount of acrylic. And let's say for a case like this, you actually do a metal, um, like a secondary metal shell. You need even more space for that. I love these cases. They're beautiful restorations. I've maybe had three in my career where I had enough space to make them. Then you just, it's not something that's attainable unless you're doing an alveo or you're really working with your surgeon to plan these cases. So this is how I typically would measure now digitally. This is in three shape. Um, and I can also do this before the implants are placed. As long as I have two models that are articulated together, I can do a 2D cross section. And sometimes they already have natural teeth, so I'll actually cut those natural teeth off and I'll kind of measure the distance. And this case was a real case that I made and we only had about six millimeters of space. And <coughs> typically in those cases, I would say no. I would say you need to now go to um, something zirconia or maybe a removable bar or a bar with locators. Uh, just because the space is really tight. This one we did end up working out. We had some interesting solutions, but normally I would say no to a case like this for an acrylic overdenture, a fixed denture. That's just not enough space. Next on the list, facial considerations. Number one is your lip support. If you look at the profile of someone's face, if they've been a dentalist for a very long time, it's going to be sunken in. They don't have any bone there. They have no support. Sometimes like facial features will change with that also. So you need to, you need to kind of look at your patient and decide, do I need lip support? Do I need a flange in here to push that lip out? Sometimes you don't, but a lot of times you do. If you do, you cannot do a fixed denture because a fixed denture cannot have a flange. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is very important. Uh, I have seen patients that have a flange with a fixed denture and it's very um, infected, they can't clean it properly, it's just not a good restoration and we end up switching them to a removable denture. And going from a fixed to a removable is not fun for the patient. So you need to be deciding these things before you're making your appliance. And then also high smile line. If you're doing a fixed denture, you're going to see that line in their mouth um, where the acrylic and their natural teeth meet. If they have a really high smile line and they smile and you can see that, that's not aesthetically pleasing. Um, so in a case like this, if I had a patient and they had a smile like this, I would not do a fixed denture. Unless I could do an alveo and I would still have enough bone and we approached it that way, then maybe if that's something that they really, really are looking for. But in a case like this, I would probably be doing uh, a bar with a removable overdenture. Next is bone quality. So for the bone quality, this is not really on us on the lab side or even on the denturist side. This is definitely for the surgeon. But there are some questions that you can be asking, that you can be aware of, that you can be knowledgeable of, that even you can see from the models. You don't necessarily need a CBCT scan, but even just looking at the models, you're able to ask some questions. Do they have a super pointy upper ridge? Is it going to be difficult to make something that sits nice? Do they have a super low smile line? Do we need to chop some of that bone off? Is the bone tapered? Um, do they have enough space for implants in general? These aren't necessarily questions that you need to be asking the lab, but you could be asking your surgeon and be part of that planning uh, just to make sure that you're making the best restoration for your patient. If your patient has lost all of their teeth because they're not good at brushing their teeth, and they, uh, their gums are bleeding all the time and they don't have any more teeth, maybe they shouldn't be getting a fixed denture. If they're smoking two packs a day, 
dentures are very porous material, so maybe they shouldn't be getting something that's porous that's fixed in their mouth permanently. This needs to be a big consideration. Again, this isn't really on us. This is more on the surgeon. Or if you're on the clinical side, this is something that you can be talking with your patients with. This is very important because your implants are going to fail. And if your implant fails, the patient's going to come back and blame you. You're going to go on Google and they're going to write you a bad review, like, hey, I got a denture and it sucks. But really, they just don't brush their teeth enough. And then lastly, patient size, weight, jaw strength. Not all patients can get, say, implants on both arches. When you get implants, if you lose all of your teeth and you have five implants, you have no proprioception. What that means is you cannot feel what you're biting. You can't tell how hard you're biting. So like this guy, this is a TikTok guy. This is a little extreme. But if your patients come in, and they have these huge muscles here, and they're young, and they're strong, they're not going to know how hard they're biting. And so doing like a fixed case on top of a fixed case where there's no movement, your teeth are going to be smashing together, your implants are going to take a lot of wear. Um, this needs to be considered. If you have a 95-year-old granny that can hardly open her mouth when she talks, it's probably fine. She's probably not going to bite down that hard. But you need to be, again, working with your surgeons, working with your doctors, kind of educating on what you want to look for in your restorations. Because what's going to happen? This is going to break. The doctor's going to call you. It's the lab's fault. You made it bad. You suck. When really, the patient looks like this and probably shouldn't have two fixed arches. Last thing that I like to go over with my surgeons is, um, and even clinically for the denturist, managing your patient's expectations. You cannot tell a patient, I will for sure get you that fixed denture in the planning stage because you don't know their bone quality. You don't know kind of um, if they are a good candidate for the amount of implants that you need, what their hygiene is like necessarily. You really need to manage these expectations. I, we would typically approach this as, I'm going to try to get you a fixed denture. However, you may need a removable denture with a bar. You may need a removable denture with no implants. We're going to be looking at all of the options here, and we're going to decide as a team how we can move forward with this. If you tell them right at the beginning, I'm going to make you a fixed denture, and then you realize, oh, no, I can't, it's really, really hard to pull that back. So we, we picked our patient. How do we decide if we want a fixed denture or if we want a bar over denture that's removable? What are the differences? What are the benefits of each? How are we going to approach this? So a bar with a removable denture is essentially a titanium bar and some kind of denture that goes over top. You can have a whole bunch of different types of clips. There's endless hundreds of clips. We'll go over some of the basics. And some of the advantages, again, you're going to have a flange for lip support. It's removable for hygiene. So as patients that don't have the hygiene, it is removable. They can clean around the bar. They can take that denture out and soak it overnight. <coughs> and some of the smaller bars, so like a hater bar, a bar with little clips, which I'll talk about in a second, you can get the profile pretty low. So if you are tight on space, you can get them to about 8 millimeters. It's still pretty tight, but it's doable, uh, depending on which bar you're looking at. Disadvantages. I think this is an excellent restoration for the patient. On the lab side, I hate these. I hate them so much. <laughs> it's really hard to process them with clips. Um, sometimes you do need more into occlusal space. If you're, like I said, if you're looking for a bar with those locators, you need a lot of space for that. And that's difficult to achieve. And again, it's difficult to process clips. The clips die. Um, they wear out. You've got to replace them. It's a pain. I hate them so much. I understand why it's good for the patient. I will make them, but I'll do the best quality I can to try to make those last a little bit longer. Uh, a bar with removable dentures. There are hundreds of different types of bars with removable dentures. It's endless. If you worked in a lab, some of these are familiar to you. Some of these older cast bars are familiar to you. Systems that don't even exist anymore. And you're calling Mark Chan in Canada and you're going, hey, I don't have any parts for this. Help me. It's, it's difficult. But if this is something that we're moving forward with with a new patient, there are some standard like top four that are the most common, that are easy to get parts for, easy to work with. So these are kind of the top four that I would prefer working with. The first one here on the left, that's a hater bar. 
So that's the profile of a hater bar, and it has a metal housing with a little plastic piece in it. The plastic pieces, they wear down pretty fast. You have to be changing them out once or twice a year, but you don't necessarily have to change out the metal housing. The next one on here is a dolder bar, also very common. This was a very common cast bar. Um, they've brought it over to the digital world, and it has a fully metal housing clip thing that goes over it. It needs to be processed. It's a little difficult to do these ones fully digitally. The third one here, that's an Ackerman bar, an Ackerman clip on a round bar. These are my favorite. I really like the way these process in. I like that here. If you can imagine, if it starts to get loose, you can grab those ends and tighten them down a little bit so you can get a little more retention without having to replace the clips as often. I really like those clips. I love working with them. If I have to do a clip bar, I'll do an Ackerman clip. And then lastly, this is a, a bar with locators or Novalox, ERAs, whatever attachment you guys prefer. You can put that on top of a bar. And <coughs> if you need to do a double structure, like I said, that's totally doable, where right here, you would have another piece of metal going over top, and that would be part of your denture. And so the, you could take it apart, you have metal on this side, metal on this side, they go together. For that, I've never ever been able to make one. I've never had a patient with enough space. I really want to make one, they're very cool, I don't have the patience for them. Patience as in people. How about a fixed denture? This isn't actually a fixed denture, it's more of a removal, but we're gonna pretend that there's a titanium bar in there. So your fixed dentures, they feel small. We're gonna make them really small, they feel natural. Patients love these. It feels like they're real teeth. They require less space. You can get these down, like I said, 10 millimeters is kind of the bare minimum, but 10 millimeters is, is decent space. Um, and you can do all acrylic on the tissue, or you can have a metal tissue fitting surface. So the advantages of metal is obviously its um, cleansability. It's very easy to keep a tissue surface of a metal denture clean. The disadvantage of a metal tissue is you can never reline it. So if you're doing an upper denture and their tissue recedes uh, even a little bit, you're gonna get whistling, you're gonna get spit, um, on the upper dentures, it's very difficult to keep that tight contact with a metal bar. It's doable, it's still a very popular restoration, but just know in the future you might have to make a new bar. With the acrylic, you can like strip all that acrylic off, make new acrylic fitting surface, and it'll still be nice and tight. I understand acrylic is porous, takes a little bit more maintenance. They'll have to be coming into your clinic or your doctor's office to get those cleaned a little more often, but I really like that you can keep that tight tight tissue fitting surface. So there's no flange, we talked about that already. Sometimes you need a flange, you need that support. Uh, some patients will not be happy. And if you don't and you have your teeth sticking out, what you're gonna get is like sunken in and then coming out. And it's gonna look like this weird shape on their mouth. We don't want that. We want it to be nice and smooth. And then again, the transition line might be uh, visible. You don't wanna have a transition zone there. So the common fixed denture style, so the first one here is that fixed acrylic wraparound. The so acrylic goes all the way around a titanium bar that's inside your denture. Um, this one here is just a, this is one that we made um, and the patient came back, so we we're just kind of taking pictures of it after they came back. This is a, um, a titanium bar with a metal, metal tissue fitting surface. And then very similar, but a little bit different is a Montreal style bar. What makes a Montreal style bar different is that metal comes right up onto the lingual surface. That's the differentiator between these two. The reason why I like a Montreal style bar, it keeps that tissue surface clean. You're not gonna get any calculus buildup that's annoying the tongue. Um, you can squeeze that restoration down a little bit but still have the support of the metal coming all the way up the backside. So, we picked a bar. We're happy, we picked a patient, we picked a bar. Now what, what are all these parts? What are all these pieces? I don't understand what everything means, it's so confusing. So it's really important to know your componentry. What are you ordering? Uh, what does it mean? What do I need? So we're gonna just go through a couple components. So one is obviously your implants. As the lab, as the clinician, you don't necessarily need to know what implants to place. Um, all your surgeons are gonna have different preferences and that's okay. You need to know what they're placing. 
I have a little picture here. You need to know what they're placing. You need to know what the platform size is. And what that means is the top of the implant can have different sizes. Doesn't matter how long it is. Doesn't matter what color it is. Doesn't matter what it's made of. You need to know what the top of the implant is. What's your connection? And you need to be kind of comfortable with working with those. Next is abutments. Abutments go on top of the implant. And so typically, if you're working with a good surgeon or a good doctor who's placing implants, they'll place the abutments for you, which is really nice, especially if you're a denturist. You don't have to be worrying about this part. And what that does, we'll talk about that, it's going to lift your connection essentially out of the tissue so it's at a better height. If you have a whole bunch of different implants, what it does is going to unify all those implants so they have all the exact same connection. These ones up here, these are um, an MUA, that's what they're called, multi-unit abutment. That's a Nobel brand. There's a whole bunch of abutments you can get into. Um, there's a bunch that look like an MUA. That's just kind of the basic standard for dentures, so I put those up there. But let's say you have 10 brands of implants in one mouth, which I have seen, it's crazy. You can put an abutment on every single one. Now your interface is the same all the way across the whole arch. Path of insertion. This is very important. What path of insertion means, when you take your bar or your final restoration, you should be able to put it in the patient's mouth and it just drops onto the implants. If you're pushing it on one side or you're coming in at a weird angle and you have to like angle it in and torque it in, what is that doing? That's pulling on your implants. And if you're pulling on your implants in any direction, you're gonna be um, harming that osseointegration. You're going to be um, kind of wrecking the harmony of all your implants working together, right? It needs to be passive. And so sometimes if you have some weird engaging implant that's at a crazy angle at the back of their mouth, you're going to have to use an angled abutment. So all of these up here are actually angled abutments. You can see they have different neck sizes, they have different angles. Typically they'll go up to a 30 degree. So you can change the angulation of that up to 30 degrees. Again, this isn't necessarily something that you will be dealing with, but you, I guarantee, will have a surgeon call you and say, hey, I don't know which abutments to buy. And if you don't know what an abutment is, it can be a little bit confusing. <laughs> up to 30 degrees, like I said. Um, and then the margin height. So your implants sometimes could be way below the tissue. And if you're trying to design a bar, or a bar with acrylic, it's very difficult to access that information. It's difficult to work on those patients. Uh, as soon as you unscrew anything, the tissue sinks in everywhere. It's not easy to work around. Putting an abutment on there raises your whole restoration to tissue level. It's much easier to work on. It's much easier to work on in the future. If you ever need to remove this prosthetic, you can, um, you can easily take it off. You don't need healing caps. They can sit there for a while. It's fun. <coughs> And like I said, it's very difficult to get a passive fit on multiple implants if they are engaging. It's very hard to get all of those implants to nicely sit if they are an engaging implant. What that means is, so if you look at the top pictures, they're nice and smooth. So you can put something like a little hat on it and you can spin it around. It's not gonna get stuck anywhere. Most implants are engaging, especially for crown or bridge, meaning you put it on you can turn it at specific angles, but it's not free turning. It's locked in into specific positions. So if you have five implants and you have a connection that's locked in in a bunch of positions, it's very, very difficult to make that even and balanced across your whole arch. So the point is, use an abutment. It's going to make your life way easier. Model analogs. I get this question all the time. What is a model analog? And for me, it seems pretty basic, but not for everybody. So a model analog goes inside your model and it is an exact representation of the implant they have in their mouth. So um, there's a lot of ways to achieve the, the uh, positioning of this, but essentially your model analog in your model is going to look exactly like the mouth. This is just a, a cheap replica, so you don't actually need real implants in your clinic, and you can just pour these up in stone. A temp cylinder, this is another one. People always ask me, um, my doctor said I need temp cylinders. What's a temp cylinder? It's a, okay, technicians like to shorten long words. We don't like to say words long. It just means it's a temporary metal cylinder. And so you can use these for a bunch of things. 
Um, we like to use them for verification jigs, and I'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, these are good for taking impressions, verification jigs, or temporaries. Like if you want to do a try-in, you could put a temp cylinder in there. It's just a piece of metal that screws onto the implant. That's all it is. But it's kind of like arts and crafts. You're using all of your tools to build something functional. Tie bases, this is another one. What is a tie base? Or people say TI base. Again, we don't like to use long words. It just means titanium base. So it's titanium and it's a base. It goes inside to restoration, like this picture here. These are all little holes that are perfectly milled out. The titanium base gets popped in there. Now you have a metal titanium connection that goes onto your abutment. That's all a tie base is. When I was first starting, it sounded like it was this big crazy deal. That's all it is. Screws. We know what screws are, obviously, but it's really important to know lab screws and prosthetic screws are not the same thing. Some, some companies don't even make lab screws, which, great. You cannot use a lab screw on the prosthetic side. They are not designed for torquing. They're not designed for long-term wear. They don't have the same coatings. If you're using prosthetic screws in the lab, that's fine. You're just processing with them. But you cannot give your dentist a restoration with a lab screw. And also, prosthetic screws are not meant to be used forever and ever one time. You should be changing them out when you're removing that prosthetic. So once a year, even if they have a bar and a denture that's removable, they should still be getting that bar taken out. They should be having their implants checked by a hygienist or a dentist. And, um, they, the screws should be changed out. We want, to we want to keep that torquing. And if you can imagine, if you're torquing a screw, those threads are having pressure on them. And so if you're taking it out, cleaning the denture, putting them back in, the, the threads are going to get stretched and stretched more. They're not going to have the same torque value that they had when you first started. So your prosthetic screws should be changed out at least once a year or every time you take the denture out. It's expensive. You can charge your patients for it. I understand it sucks. That's the way it is. Um, scan bodies. What is a scan body? Uh, a lot of people ask me this too. I don't know what a scan body is. I don't know what a scan flag is. So what this does in the digital world, it's going to help us tell the computer exactly where those implants are. So if I scanned in a model, or in this case, this is just um, an intraoral scan, you can see I have all my little implants there. If I try to make something to this scan, the bottom of my implants are going to be all messed up and kind of chunky and messy. The holes, like how do I tell the computer where the holes go? How do I align that? I use a scan body. So this example, these are little metal scan bodies. They're screwed into the mouth or on a model. You can do either or and you take a scan of it. So you can either scan it on your bench scanner or in your intraoral scanner. And what this does is we can now align this on our computer to a digital version of the scan body. And that allows us to have a bar or a restoration that has accurate hole placements. If this one turns around here in a second. And also the connection to the abutment is going to be smooth and clean and cut to how it needs to be cut. It's not actually cut to your model. It's cut to the digital um, version of your implant. I hope that makes sense for everybody. This is why you need to have scan bodies. This is why you need to know which scan bodies they're using so you can align them properly in your lab or your clinic. So scan bodies, this is, um, these are the ones that Arjun has. They are made out of peak. Uh, these are intraoral or lab. You can use either or. But honestly, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scan bodies. Uh, uh, my suggestion, if you're working for a new client or you're working for a dentist that's comfortable with this, I would find a scan body that you like to work with. Come talk to me later. I love talking about digital things. And I would try to get your practitioners to use the same scan bodies. Um, if they're working primarily with your lab, they'll be happy to buy a pack of 10 scan bodies and send you those files. It just makes your life a lot easier if you know which libraries you're using in your software. If you don't know which, trust me, every day there's posts on the Facebook pages. Does anybody know what scan body this is? Does anybody know who makes these? There's so many types. So I would try to get your dentist onto one platform 
It's going to make your life a lot easier. All right. We have all our components. We're ready to go. Um, why are we going to make this digitally? One, it's more accurate. So we're using our design software. We're using extra scans. We're bringing in extra information. It's going to be a much more accurate end result compared to analog, where we're setting teeth in wax and we're guessing where things are. It's, it's, it's just not the same. And we can do 3D printed or milled temporaries, which we couldn't really do in the past. Um, they can be reproduced. You can change the bite, the freeway, all of that before you make your final restoration. So we can use digital kind of as a stepping stone instead of making two final restorations or making one and then adjusting the occlusion 100 times, um, we can make a temporary. And then of course, there's less chair time for you and the patient. Um, there's no chair side conversions, which I can talk about another time. But um, there's a lot of ways we can use digital to harness um, more information and less time, essentially, but still having a really, really good end product. Uh, like I said, more accuracy. So your final denture, you can actually mill them. I, I wouldn't print them at this point. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you can mill your final fixed denture. It's going to be a lot more accurate. You're not going to have any shrinking or warpage from cooking your acrylic. It's going to, like you're milling it out of a puck. It's stationary. It's not moving. You have a beautiful final product fits right over your bar. Everything fits how it's supposed to. There's no adjusting. <clears throat> and then again, more accurate access holes for your prosthetic screws. For those of you here that have already made an implant denture, how many times have you drilled a hole through and it's in the wrong spot and now you got this big gaping hole and you got to like pick another tooth or fill it with some acrylic? It's painful. It's terrible. I've done it. It's horrible. Um, you, it, let the mill cut it for you. This makes your life way easier. Let's design. Let's design a denture. This is exciting. <laughs> so data acquisition. We need data. So obviously, you're going to need an impression. This is a traditional splinted impression. On the lab side, we're not technically making too much. This is more prosthetically driven. However, now that we have intraoral scanners, I would prefer to do it this way. And I know that there is a lot of discussion of um, Dimensional stability, uh, if you're scanning a whole arch, kind of how that information is transferring over. I can tell you from personal experience, we did, before I left and came to Arjun, we probably did around 50 bars or so, fully digital, intraoral scanned, and the fit was exceptional. So passive, they went right into the mouth, no issues with them. Um, you're not pouring a model, so if I'm taking an impression and I'm pouring a model, who's pouring that model? Are they measuring the stone? Is it accurate? Is there any bubbles in it? Is it expanding? Is it shrinking? Did they wait for it to sit long enough? There's a lot of variables. With this, it's just a scan. And you can get a pretty accurate scan. The difficult part is, how do I get a bite? The patient doesn't have anything to bite on. How do I get a bite? This is still being discussed. There's a lot of tips and tricks for getting a good bite for us. If we knew that we were having um, like a day of surgery or we were planning this, we actually would make like a little bite thing to um, give us an accurate bite for our temporaries, for our finals. And so we would design this in the partial software. And obviously this isn't for every patient. This patient um, was getting six anterior teeth removed. So we were able to make a little bite holder thing. And on the day of surgery, this patient, we, we scanned them, the surgeon scanned them, they took the bite with our little bite thing that we made, and we were able to make them a very accurate temporary denture the same day. So there are some innovative ways to get a bite. This won't work for everybody, obviously, um, but there's coming up with more and more ideas. So once you have your data, sometimes you're going to want a model. So how do I go from an intraoral scan to a model? Why do I need a model? Sometimes if you're going to be using um, like a wraparound acrylic fixed denture, you're going to have to process that tissue side. There's no way around it. You can't mill that around a bar. It will have to be processed somehow. And so you're going to need a model. So this is a 3D printed model. I personally find this a little intimidating. I find this a little scary. 
If you're not exceptionally good at printing and following the IFU exactly, you could have a little bit of resin in those little holes. Those model analogs snap inside your model. So you print a model with holes, you get your model analog, you clip them in. Some of them have little screws on the bottom, you can screw them in. You could have variance in your printer. You could have variance in cleaning. It could wiggle a little. Maybe it's not seated all the way. How do you know? That makes me uncomfortable. So actually, um, this was inspired by my friend John Wilson. He's around here somewhere. He posted this online. Not this. This is just another model. And this is how I make my model. So number one, this is my scan. I'm going to make a bar design. It's going to be ugly because I'm making it in less than three minutes. It doesn't need to be pretty. The important part about it is it's cut to your tissue a lot. It's deep on the tissue. It's cut all the way around. <laughs> With that, I am now also going to cut my model. This is in Model Builder in 3Shape. You can cut your model to have pink gingiva only. So once this kind of goes around here, you'll see I can now print this pink gingiva. And I can print that white bar in two separate things. And this is what I'm left with. So I now have my pink gingiva, I have my white bar, I have my model analogs. What I'm going to do is I put my, my model analogs, I screw them into that bar, and I have the pink tissue underneath. So they're all squished together. And sometimes, sometimes here, like if there's a little bit of space, because um, this, this is a soft tissue material, it has a little give, I like to just wax it down with some wax. And then, um, and then I pour a base in stone. And so I still have a model that I can work with. I have a model that I can uh, process on or make a verification jig on. But for me personally, this feels more comfortable. I know my model analogs are in the right spot. I know they're not too high. They're not wiggling around. Printed models are excellent. But you really need to be um, aware of cleaning them, getting your accuracy down, getting all of your settings down for your model analogs. This way, you can guarantee it's quick, it's fast, and you know your implants are in the right spot. Verification jig. What is verification jig? This is essentially verifying that the model you have, be it digital or analog, is exactly the same as the patient's mouth. I always, always, always do a verification jig, every time. Um, if you don't, you're going to have potentially a case that isn't seating properly, and you have to pay to remake that bar. Most companies will not give you another free bar because they're guaranteeing the fit to the model. So if your model is not the exact same as the patient's mouth, they will not remake you a new bar. They don't care. So this is going to be saving you time. This is going to be saving you money. This is just three different examples of verification jigs. The one on the top side, right, left, whatever, this one. It, um, this is a fully printed one. We were kind of playing around. We printed some, we milled some. There's a lot of materials. This depends on uh, clinician preference. How are they checking if this is seated? So they need to put this in the mouth. They need to check that it's passive, and they need to check that it's seated all the way down. So if they're doing it by feel, which some clinicians do, I would not do a 3D printed one. I would do something like this. This is just a traditional analog verification jig. It has temp cylinders or tie bases that connect to the implant. That gives you that. You can feel it in the mouth as you're screwing it in. What you do is you screw it on one side. And then um, if there's any rocking, it's obviously not passive. If you're screwing it on one side and nothing's moving, you know it's passive. If they're doing a radiograph, you can actually print radio opaque or I believe you can mill radio opaque materials. Um, so you, they can put it in the mouth, they can do an x-ray, and they can make sure it's seated. In that case, you don't necessarily need a metal connection. And then this version here is just split up, and there's numbers on it so that your clinician can um, bond it in the mouth. A lot of people, this is a little bit more of an older method. The reason why we started doing this is because these analog versions, sometimes when you make them in the lab, They'll shrink a little bit or they'll warp a little bit. So you can slice them. The dentist will put them into the mouth. And they will connect them themselves with the intraoral material. And then you'll have a solid bridged unit. Take that out of the mouth. You know it's passive now. Put it on your model. Make sure it's passive. 
It's very, very important to do a verification jig. And if you're not printing a model, you can still do a verification jig. Essentially, your digital verification jig is telling you that is what our digital scan has, that is what our digital information has. If that matches the mouth, you're golden. Tooth setup. Nobody talks about tooth setup. And if you don't come from the removables world, this can be intimidating. So it's really, really important to understand your tooth setup for these full arch cases. So what is the opposing arch restoration? Is it natural dentition? Is it a sacrificial arch? And what I mean by that, by a sacrificial arch, remember how I said when you get implants, you have no proprioception. You can't feel how hard you're biting. And so with a sacrificial arch, sometimes on the lower, you'll have a traditional denture, or you'll have a denture with locators, because it's still very tissue-based. So you, you have a little bit of movement on the bottom. So even if they're biting down really hard, it's not going to force those implants to go anywhere. It's not going to be jostling things around. So sometimes, like I said, if you had a patient with a big jaw, or the really big guy, or they're young, maybe you need to have a sacrificial arch so they can't both be fixed dentures. Um, is it a fixed opposing a fixed? If it is, the setup needs to be bang on. You need to have your bite bang on, and you need to have your setup set up uh, in a way where you're not going to be slamming into anything, because they cannot feel if they're biting too hard. Uh, and what material is the opposing arch? So is it acrylic? Is it zirconia? Is it a natural tooth? These are all things you need to take into consideration before you start setting your teeth. For me personally, oh, just kidding, we're going to talk about um, some occlusion here. So centric occlusion, centric. So when you bite down, that is your centric occlusion. Uh, and Eccentric occlusion is any time you move your jaw out of its static position and the teeth are touching. That's an eccentric occlusion. A balanced occlusion, which those of you who are indentures, you know, any time you're in eccentric position, any time your mouth moves around, your teeth are touching and contacting in ways that do not disrupt your dentures. So I understand that we're not making removable dentures here, so they're not going to fall out of your mouth. However, if you're doing canine guidance and you have a fixed denture, what that's going to do is, depending on what your lowers are, you can knock out your lowers, you could break teeth. This is acrylic. This is not zirconia. These are things you need to be taking into a consideration. So this is just a couple examples of what these look like. So um, I know if you went to tech school, you know what these are. You have your working, your balance, and your centric. In each of these movements, so if your jaw is moving to the left, your jaw is moving to the right, your jaw is moving forward. If you have a denture, you have even contacts in all of those movements. Nothing is hitting, nothing is jumping. It's smooth contacts all the way around. Now, the easiest way to uh, achieve that is a lingualized tooth setup. Does everyone know what a lingualized tooth setup is? Um, I had a picture here. Come on, picture. Essentially, on the lower, you have a... Um, kind of like a monoplane tooth. Not necessarily monoplane, but something with lower cusps. And on the upper, you'll have typically a 30 degree tooth. And what that does is, when they're biting down, if their bite is not like bang on, like it's hard to get a bite that is exactly accurate, they can kind of move around to a couple places uh, and it'll be okay. Like a freedom in centric bite. It's not gonna hurt anything. Also, it's going to centralize your vertical forces. So the forces are always going to be right in the center of that tooth. Uh, even if they're biting a little to the left, a little to the right, the forces are always going down. Because if you can imagine that if this was a 30 degree and a 30 degree, you have to be right in the center of that tooth. And if you're not, you're kind of hitting the edges. You could break off a cusp. You're going to wear it weird. It's not going to fit right. Um, and then also, uh, if so some people, they get away with this by doing fully monoplane because then their patient can bite wherever they want. They're not locked in, complete freedom of motion. Uh, it's really hard to chew when you don't have any cusps. And the whole point of getting a fixed denture is to help us chew better. So I personally would not do monoplane on monoplane. I like to have a nice strong cusp on the upper so they can chew into a steak and they can eat it nicely. Okay, 
Phonetic troubleshooting. This is not talked about enough in our industry. If we're doing a setup and our dentist comes to us and says, uh, they can't say S, they can't say T. Sometimes for us it's really hard to understand how we need to make those changes. Sometimes the dentist doesn't even know how to make those changes. So these are just a couple of things to be aware of. So a whistle when you're saying S. Everyone say S. Say 66. 66. Your tongue is right up the top, right behind your front teeth. So if you're whistling, it's either there's not enough room between your bicuspids, so when you say S, it's squeezing your tongue together, or you have um, a diastema, which some patients like a diastema, that's fine, if their natural teeth had it, that's fine, but if there's a lot of whistling and that bothers them, they may need to narrow that down just a little bit, just to get those phonetics in there. Lisping on the S, say 66. If you're saying 66, sometimes your, um, your bicuspids are too wide, they're set too far apart, or you don't have enough acrylic in there, if, you're, if they need to be set there, that's okay. You can add a little wax lid, uh, ledge. It's going to bring in that air space a little bit, and they're going to be able to say 66. F and V sound the same. So if you say Darth Vader is Luke's father, you can feel the difference in your mouth. Say F and V, it's all in the lip, in the lower lip. So if it's all in the lower lip, that means it's your upper anterior teeth. They're either too long or they're too short. Something in there needs to be adjusted. If, if they cannot say the difference between F and V. T and TH sound the same. If you go T, 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 and you go the, so the top, when you're saying the, your tongue is coming onto the bottom of your teeth, the top. So for that, there's not enough space for the tongue. So your anterior teeth might be too far lingual. You need to bring them out a little bit so that they can say the difference between the and t. And uh, that's all I have for these ones. There's quite a bit more. If you really want to get into depth with these, I would honestly just Google these. There's so many um, good tips like that. I have a nice cheat sheet that I like to use. So when someone comes to me and says, my patient is whistling, they can't say 66, they can't say the. I kind of know how to fix that. I'll approach my setups a little bit differently. Um, especially if naturally, before they had dentures, if their teeth were all snaggly and they were struggling with phonetics, these are some of the ways that you can accomplish kind of changing that with your tooth setup. And then AP spread. Who knows what AP spread is? A couple people. It means, again, we don't like using long words. It means your anterior, posterior spread. How long are those implants spread apart? How long can we have something sticking off the back of this before it becomes a cantilever that's going to break off. What is our measurements here? How can we figure out the math? So what you're going to do is, you're going to go from your most anterior implant, or where you, if you're, this is planning, it would be where you think the most anterior one is going to be, all the way back to your most posterior implant. And the standard in industry is multiplying that by 1.5. You can do two, 2.5, that's really pushing the limits. Multiplying that number by 1.5 is going to tell you what your maximum length back here can be. For a lot of fixed cases, you cannot have four posterior teeth in the back because you're going to, what it's going to do is, if you think about it, you have your implant, you have this big long bar sticking off the back, you're going to be putting pressure on that implant, okay? It's going to be torquing it backwards. So there is a limit. I've actually seen titanium bars snap in half um, on the backs because the cantilever was too long. So this needs to be taken into consideration. The nice thing about 3-shape, it tells it for you. If you're making your bar, it turns into a red line and it says it's too long. And it's based off of a 1.5 measurement. So 3-shape does it for you. If you wanted to measure it kind of in an analog way, you can do that too. Um, but this is really, really important when setting your teeth. So once you have your teeth set, we have to do the wax up. So for any kind of denture that's fixed in the mouth, you cannot have a flange. You cannot have anything coming over the ridge. It needs to be convex. Convex is the right way, yes. It needs to be a nice convex just touching the tissue. Uh, and you can have pressure on the tissue, that's okay. You can have a little bit of pressure. Um, but they have to be able to get something in there, like nice big puffy floss, 
or a little brush. So your wax ups need to be nice and rounded if it's a fixed denture. If it's a regular denture, I understand. This is a denture. Um, it is acrylic. It's hard to make these look beautiful. You can use some staining glaze afterwards, but personally with these fixed dentures, they typically don't tend to last. Find they rub off after a while. Um, really characterizing the shape of your wax up. Understanding how the light is reflecting off of these shapes. So if you're having, if it's all smooth and round, it's gonna look like a smooth blob of wax. If you have your nice characterizing, you have your festoons, you have a little bit of lines in there, you don't necessarily need to characterize with colors. You can characterize with the shape of your wax up. Also, again, with your wax up, consider your minimum thicknesses. If this is gonna break, it's gonna break because one, your cantilever is too long, two, your wax up is too thin. So if you didn't plan for this, you didn't make enough space, it's gonna break. So, we have designed our case. We set the teeth, we did a lingualized occlusion, we made our wax up really nice, and now we're gonna print a prototype. So, in three shape, once you've done your digital denture wax up, you can take that wax up and punch holes into it. This is how you would achieve that. You would select where all of your implants are, and you would set this up as a wax up bridge. And what that's gonna do, I think I have a little video here, and it runs you through the software. It's like five easy buttons. And at the end of it, you have your denture setup that you've designed in your denture software. It has nice little holes in it. It's all one piece. It has your, your fixture levels right to your abutments. Uh, and you can try that in the patient's mouth. So this isn't a try-in with a flange and all of that. This try-in looks exactly like your final product. It is extremely important to have a try-in, that is where your final product is going to be. With these fixed cases, we typically do one to two, sometimes three try-ins. Um, the reason why is you're designing a bar to fit in that try-in. If you only have eight millimeters of space, it's really tight, or you're trying to do a metal bar on the tissue, you need to know exactly where those teeth are. So if you send for try-in, and, and it comes back, and they're telling you, can you, move the plane this way, can you rotate the teeth, I want this tooth that way, this tooth that way, go to finish. Uh-uh, I would be calling them and I would be telling them I need another try-in. I cannot design a bar if I don't know where my teeth are gonna be. So it's really, really important to get your try-ins bang on before you go to make your bar. We don't wanna make extra bars, okay? It's a lot of money. So let's design the bar. We love our try-in, this looks great. In three shape, in 2022, in the newest software, it's a lot easier to design your own bar shapes. I have designed several. I have a Montreal bar, I have a Paris bar, I have a couple different designs. If that's something that you guys want, let me know. I can email you the, the libraries. I'm totally open to sharing. This is one that I made recently. So if you can imagine, this is gonna be a Montreal bar. Remember how I said the, the metal's gonna come up on the lingual side? And it has a nice little finishing ledge here. So the acrylic's gonna just butt up with that on that side, same with on the lingual side. And uh, we can add attachments, so we can add some fixtures to it. In three shape, you can also tell it, so here all these little handles are different colors. You can tell it where you want your handles, how you wanna use it. What I mean by handles is in three shape, you have all these little buttons and things that you can pull and change. So I told it that I want my handles at these specific places because those are the things that I like to change and modify. And so you can see here, this is kind of what it looks like in the three shape software. I'm just adjusting this, moving this around, getting the shape that I want for a Montreal style bar. And I think it's, it's gonna go through a little bit more of the design here in a second. So you can see here, I've sped it up a little bit. This is a Montreal style bar. So it has metal tissue fitting surface with a lingual side, the metal is coming up. So I need my acrylic to blend right into that metal. So this is what I mean by it's extremely important to have your try-in exactly where you want it. Because how do you know where to make the bar so that your profile is coming nice and rounded with your acrylic? So with these types of restorations, you need to have an accurate try-in before you can make this. Uh, it's very difficult to make changes afterwards. You have to like grind the bar, it's really annoying. Um, I think it's going to load here in one second. So I've cut this to the tissue and 
Now I have a couple of undercuts, so I'm just going to come in and smooth those out, round those out, so I have a nice rounded tissue fitting surface. I can check the pressure of that. Um, if, it's, if it's really, really tight on the tissue, it can be adjusted chair side. They can check for blanching and see if it's too tight. A little bit of compression is always good, um, but you don't want it to be over compressed. So this is just a little cross section. It's showing the shape of the bar. I'm going to turn the teeth on here in a second. You can see my wax up. Oh, I turned it around. My wax up here is going to come right down and around where that bar is. And so I want it to be a nice, smooth transition to where my bar is uh, with these types of restorations. It's a lot easier to design a bar with clips. I don't have a video of that, but essentially, you just design your bar to fit under your teeth. That's it. You just need enough space for your clips, and that's it. Um, these types of restorations are a little bit more difficult. So you can see here I'm adding some pins, and that's just going to add some mechanical retention. So now I have my bar. It fits under my teeth. I have pins for mechanical retention. I think I have, a, I have one here. This one doesn't have the pins. We added it after the fact. The manufacturer um, was trying some new things. But you can imagine it would have metal pins. And this is kind of what it looks like. So this wax up is blended in. I mean, on the computer, it has a little bit of a ledge. But the acrylic is easy to polish down. I'd rather it be a little too big. So you have your teeth, you have your base, and you have your bar. So now you have three files that you're working with. And uh, you can mill all these files. You can outsource this, send it to somebody else. They'll make it for you. But essentially, your design of your bar for these types of restorations is going to be nice and curved with your wax up. This is what it would look like when it was finished. This case was very tight. Again, this isn't like I didn't manufacture this. I just designed this. Somebody else manufactured this. I was just helping on the design on this, a very, very tight case. So we were able to kind of make a nice bar. Um, and this is a Montreal style bar. No, this is, yes it is. It comes up on the lingual a little bit. And you can see the acrylic blends in nicely with the metal bar. So these are a little bit more complicated to design. If you're designing a bar with clips, like I said, it would just go right underneath your teeth so that when you're putting your clips on, it's underneath where your tooth forces are. So you want the bar to be under the occlusals of your teeth when you're putting those clips on. Uh, this one here, this is, this bar here would be a wraparound bar. So I've now, I can see the space underneath here. I have a nice space of about two millimeters, so my acrylic can go all the way around that bar. Um, and then I've just designed a denture to go over top. So once I have my bar designed, I can scan it back in. That's what I've done here. I designed my bar, I sent it to a manufacturer, somebody else can mill that for me, I'm not doing that. And I put that bar back on my model and I scanned it in. And in three shape, you can actually block it out. So what you're going to end up with is a shell. And what you can do with that shell, so here, I now have a denture with a shell and the titanium bar fits right inside. So now I can try in the bar. It is very important to try in the bar before you're finishing your restoration. You want to make sure it's passive. I know we did a verification jig, but it's really, really important to make sure that your bar is passive. So you want to have, um, you want to have an, uh, one last try-in before you finish your case. If you're doing a bar with clips, uh, you'll just try in the bar. You don't necessarily need to try in the teeth again, but you can do it all in one if you wanted to. And for ours, we would just do a little bit of wax on the bottom so it kind of fits the tissue a little bit nicer. Do a try and make sure everything's passive. And then we mailed it. So I would not print these. I do not think printed materials have the strength currently for a final implant restoration. For a temporary, of course, print your heart out. Put some titanium bases in there for a temporary, you're good to go. For a final milled denture, I would mill these. And I would try to mill these out of a high quality puck material something that's not going to degrade or warp. Um, at Argen, we have the high impact parks, and you can work with your milling partners and ask them to use a high impact puck. We're not the only ones that have them. I really like the way ours look, um, but that's something that you can ask your milling partners to use. So you're getting a high density puck that can withstand those forces. Again, no proprioception. They cannot feel how hard they're biting. You want to use high quality products on these cases. We can't offer them a zirconia case for multiple reasons, be it pricing, be it um, the space, be it materials, 
if we're offering them an acrylic um, substitute, we want to be offering them the highest quality acrylic substitute that we can. For these types of bars where you have a wrap around, this is what your milk denture is going to look like. And it's going to just pop right on top of your bar. Um, for, the, for the ones with clips or um, with uh, like locators, same thing. But you cannot pick up the clips in the mill, obviously. So you'll have to either pick them up in the mouth, those little housings, or you'll have to do it on the bar in the lab. Uh, personally, I would prefer to pick them up in the mouth. I always think it's more accurate. Plus, I'm a lab tech, less work for me. But it's totally doable to do it on the bar. We have the physical bar before the patient gets the bar. Do it in the lab. That's doable. This one's going to be a wraparound. So the like, acrylic's going to go all the way around. So what we did is we flashed it up and we did a reline. Um, and we like to do heat care relines. Again, we're doing the best product quality that we can. So we just flashed it up like a regular reline. Um, we like to use IvoCap, use whatever you want. And you can see here we have a nice tissue fitting surface. And uh, we can reline that. We can add to that. It's easy to adjust. I wouldn't always do acrylic. It's not for every patient. But, but most of the time, we're doing an acrylic wraparound bar. And then you're going to insert it. This is a real patient. This is a case that we did last year. Uh, two acrylic fixed dentures. I don't have her before pictures, but it was rough. And um, we did several try-ins to make sure we could get as close as we could before we're doing the bars. And she's young. She was uh, early 40s, and she has two full fixed ar uh, arches. And they look so good. She was so happy with them. Um, she was able to speak better. How I was saying about the phonetics. They look natural. They look great. And that's just milled acrylic. That's not carded teeth. There's nothing, there's no gradia on there. That's just a milled acrylic. And it looks really natural. Patient's happy. I'm happy. And it's great. So that's all I have. But I really want to hear your questions. I love questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Uh, good question. So he's just asking um, when I milled this if it was like a pink and white puck, like the Ivotion, I'm assuming, or if it was a pink and then a white and then I bonded it. Um, there is no way currently to output these files really for Ivotion. Uh, just the way that three shape works with this type of restoration, because you're doing the implants and all of that, it's hard, very, very difficult to get it in the Ivotion all in one puck. Um, I, and also, uh, I like to use a really high density puck, and I don't think that the Ivotions are at that density that I would like. So I milled pink, I milled white, bonded them together. Um, for these fixed cases, I typically don't remount my denture cases. For a fixed case, I always remount them. I want to just make sure that bite's on. Also, if I'm relining the base, I want to make sure everything's set. It's sitting on the bar how it's supposed to sit, and then I'll reline it. So yeah, two different colors. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, so I was using a Trios 3 for all of our cases. We had a Trios 3. Um, I can't speak really to any other intraoral scanners at the moment. I haven't played with them. Obviously, a 4 or 5 is going to be better than a 3 even. Um, and that's kind of what I was talking about, inter interdimensional stability. One of our surgeons that we worked with had a prime scan. That's all he used. When I got my cases back, I'll just go back to this slide here real quick. When I would get my cases from this surgeon, um, I would just have a scan with just the scan bodies. There's no other scans. Just one scan, just a standard scan body scan. Geez, that was pretty long ago. And uh, like I said, we've done over 50 cases, and we had excellent success. Part of that is the verification jig. So we always, always do a verification jig. Yeah, that slide's far away. We always do a verification jig. Um, but we were finding with the digital, we never had to take a new scan. Our verification jigs were bang on. I, I thought the exact same thing, and I was very skeptical. But doing the verification jig, trying in those bars, that's your guarantee. 
try a couple. If it's failing, if it's not working, then obviously there's something not going right there. We just tried it and we said, if it's not gonna work, we'll do an analog, that's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, our verification jigs were always bang on, so that's kind of how we knew that it was working and it was working all right. And you don't have to capture quite as much tissue if you're doing um, like a fixed case. You really only need the ridge. So if you're really just focusing your scan on one area and you're not trying to get all the flanges and all that and get everything, it's a lot easier to scan those cases in. Anybody else? No? All right. Yes? I prefer a lingualized occlusion. I prefer a lingualized occlusion because, like I was saying, it gives you a little bit more freedom and centric. And like I was saying, they don't have any proprioception, so they can't feel if they're not biting right. So it just gives them a little bit more freedom. I think aesthetically, it looks really nice too. I like the look of a lingualized occlusion. For all my fixed cases, I'll do a lingualized occlusion for sure. Yes? So keeping fixed implant bridge without any metal still has same strains. Yeah, uh, no. So, so what he's asking is if you're making a fixed, um, a fixed restoration and there's no titanium bar, what's the strength like? The titanium bar is really splinting all of your implants together with a solid piece of metal. Um, I know there are people that do all acrylic. If you're doing all acrylic, you absolutely need to have a titanium base in there, at least at the bare minimum, so that your interface has a metal connection so you can torque it down. I just don't think you're going to get the same strength out of that um, with a titanium bar splinting all of your implants together. Acrylic can fracture. You can get little micro fractures. If their bite's really hard on one side, it's going to wear that acrylic down on one side. It's never going to wear the titanium. A titanium is going to constantly splint those implants together. Your acrylic might break around it, but it's not going to affect your implants. Yes? Quick question. So when you did the try and the after verification is perfect, the aesthetics were beautiful, yep. designs are bomb. Yep. Do you have to do another scan in order to merge your setup to the bar? Okay, good question. So he's asking, um, once I've designed my bar, so I have my try and design, I have my bar design, do I need to, um, do I need to scan my bar again on the model? So there's, a, there's ways to approach this. Depends on who's manufacturing your bar. That's my answer. If it's a really good manufacturer, you can just take that digital design. You don't need to scan your bar, and you can merge them. Um, but some manufacturers, uh, the bar isn't exactly, exactly, exactly like your design. So you'll be adjusting a little bit to fit it on if you're using your digital file as opposed to scanning it. I like to scan it. Um, yeah. I think it, it just it fits a little better, it's easy. But you don't have to redesign. So if you have your try-in and you need a new model, you can actually just swap out those models. So if you ever need help with that, give me a call, I'll help you. Next question. It's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That is an excellent question. I don't know. I will get back to you on that. She's just asking if we have plastic temp cylinders. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. A tie base for a for like a a verification jig. Yeah. Exactly. It's a little pricey. Uh, yeah. The metal temp cylinders. There's also libraries in three shape for a metal temp cylinder. It'll cut the hole out for your metal ones, and you can use that also. Uh, but I'll check on the plastic ones for sure. Anybody else? That's okay. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? No? Okay, I am going to be here. I uh, love talking about dentures. Tomorrow I'm doing um, no implants, just a denture workflow kind of clinically. Um, what are the clinical workflows for that? How you can work with them? So please come talk to me. I love talking about dentures. I'll talk about implants all night long. Please come see me. I'll be in the room here um, and I'll be around. Everyone's around. So thank you guys so much. Thank you.